Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Brian Morgenstern, head of public policy at Riot Platforms. Brian recently joined Riot to help advocate for the Bitcoin mining industry in Washington, D.C. We talk about the SEC's crackdown staking providers, Operation Chokepoint 2.0, and opportunities for policymakers in the space. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Really excited for today's conversation. It falls right after some big news from the SEC last week with SEC announced an action against uh, Kraken for its staking arm. Uh, we have Brian Morgan starting to join us today from Riot Platforms. Brian, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation. Let's dive right in. Awesome. Well, you just joined Riot Platforms as the head of public policy. Obviously, Riot plays a very important place within the Bitcoin mining space and within the Bitcoin space writ large. You guys are now the largest uh, miner by market cap. And obviously, with your play in Texas, also very important within that state. So public policy is only becoming more important. And we want to get you on the podcast as soon as possible once you joined. I think we should really start with the SEC thing. We talked about it a little bit last week on my news roundup on the podcast, but it was a bunch of layman's opinion a bunch of plebs, if you will. And so it's great to get someone like yourself who has actually informed opinion on what happened with the SEC and maybe as it uh, has to do with mining as well. So boot it over to you. Any thoughts on what SEC did with Kraken? Yeah, I mean, my initial thoughts are that um, it is sort of a piece of this broader agenda I'm seeing amongst regulators. It's not only the SEC, it's also the bank regulators um, which we can get into, and then potentially energy regulators that are taking a, you know, I think a kind word to use would be skeptical. I think probably the more accurate word would be a hostile approach um, to our industry because, look, digital assets, Bitcoin in particular, since we're a Bitcoin miner, um, they're recognized as property by the IRS. They're recognized as, uh, you know, commodities, uh, in futures, um, they're recognized as things that people can hold as stores of value and exchange. Um, and yet we have sort of some parts of our government coming after them from multiple fronts. Um, in terms of mining, look, mining is like the safest thing you can do in, uh, in, in this asset class. Staking, of course, is like a layer removed. I had a great conversation with, um, some former government officials whose attitude on this was, okay, it's like a layer of, of additional risk beyond mining, but it's still a pretty traditional uh, financial services product. And the fact that they're coming after that in such a hostile way means two things. It means, one, they're going to kind of take as much rope as they'll be given by Congress uh, in a hostile position to the industry. And two is... You know, Congress really ne needs to get a hold of this, needs to rein in the regulators because this isn't a regulated enough industry at this point. There aren't rules of the road. The the SEC and others are sort of making it up as they go along. Uh, Commis Commissioner Peirce, Hester Peirce, her dissents uh, have been pretty widely praised by the industry because she's saying we need to enable innovation. Rules of the road are good, ensure fairness, ensure consumer protection, but this kind of regulation by enforcement is neither fair nor fostering innovation. And so I think this, you know, what I view is a pretty extraordinary step that they took last week, um, I think is of a piece of this larger sort of more hostile stance that several branches of the government or agencies of government have. Uh, I don't think it's good for the industry. I don't think it's good for consumers. Um, I don't think it's good for consumer protection or allowing people to earn from their assets as they should be able to. So um, Congress needs to get all of this. I'm hopeful that they will uh, in the coming months or you know year or two. But uh, it, we have some some bumps in the road to come before we get everything sorted out. I'm definitely with you on that. I hope Congress does take some actions. Uh, just a follow up question here. The thing that the SEC took an action against with Kraken was not the staking necessarily, but it was the offering of financial services with the staking, right? The fact that you could do certain staking things with it and looking through the information that I received or I was looking at showed that 
Kraken wasn't always staking tokens. They sort of had like this liquid pool and they were really marketing this APY on top of it. And that's what the SEC was taking enforcement action against. For mining, that's where the like attack angle, if you will, or attack vector seemed to come across to me where it wasn't necessarily the staking and it won't necessarily be the mining, but it might be the financial services that are offered on top of staking or offered on top of mining. Do you like agree with that or do you see any sort of angle with mining here that like there's some sort of threat because of what the SEC did here? So I think that they're taking an incremental approach down a slippery slope uh, is kind of the way I'm looking at it. If you look at some of the statements coming from the White House, from their report out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, from what we're seeing in letters from certain members on Capitol Hill to the agencies, is they're sort of triangulating um, around the industry. They're attacking mining on the energy and climate front, uh, certainly directly. They're trying to isolate the industry from traditional financial services uh, in terms of the financial services regulatory apparatus. And we're seeing the banking regulators, the securities regulators, and the political branch of the White House and certain members on the Hill, all kind of rowing in the same direction, um, I think down a slippery slope towards not just you know cutting off these assets from the traditional financial industry, but making it as hard as possible for Americans to participate uh, in these industries, either as consumers, creators, traders, um, you, know, you name it. Um, I see a lot of kind of hostile statements and actions that are like I said, going down a slippery slope to the same place, which is not a good place. And that's why we need Congress to provide some clarity, some legislation. Awesome. Well, I appreciate getting the hot take on that from you as it just occurred. Uh, we can take a step back and go back into mining land a little bit, which our audience will, will probably appreciate it. Um, but let's talk about yourself. Let's talk about Riot Platform. And then later in the conversation, we'll get back to opportunities, fears, risks in the space. It's probably where the meat of the conversation will lie. But want to come back a step and get a profile on yourself and then talk about the Bitcoin policy landscape as you see it so far. Sure. So I um, started my career working on Capitol Hill for a member of Congress named Rodney Freelingheisen from New Jersey, which is where I grew up, um, and then worked for the House Natural Resources Committee, uh, where we did a lot of sort of land use, uh, energy rights, issues like that. Uh, and then went to law school, practiced law, represented financial institutions and high net worth individuals in New York. I then came to Washington, back to Washington in 2017 uh, and joined the Trump administration at the Treasury Department, where I was chief speechwriter to the secretary, Stephen Mnuchin, and then became the deputy assistant secretary. We worked on a lot of policy issues from our fintech report, uh, sort of hinting at Regulatory sandboxes would be a good thing, allowing innovation to sort of get a foothold and then building guardrails as appropriate. Um, that was a really fun project. We worked on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the CARES Act, and the COVID relief programs, a lot of interesting things. And then I wrapped up the administration at the White House. I worked on uh, Supreme Court confirmation of Amy Cody Barrett and Operation Warp Speed um, and other sort of COVID issues. And then um, ran my own consulting company for a while and then joined Riot uh, recently because I'm so just interested in this space. I think it's going to be the most active policy area and the most interesting one for the next couple of years. And it's just a great group of people that I like at Riot. Um, and it's fun to be a part of a disruptor and innovator, which I think our company is. So here I am. Um, I'm going to do my best to position the company, advocate well for us uh, and our industry because I think we need it. We need a lot of relationship development, a lot of education, and a lot of advocacy in Washington so that we can create the most advantageous sort of policy landscape um, for all the innovators in our industry. It's just, we are we are disrupting. That always comes with some friction, uh, but I think we're going to leave ourselves, our industry, and customers all better off, uh, all, all better off at, at the end of it. It's just going to take a year or two to get this done. Yeah, there's definitely like a lot of different uh, policy institutions out there. So just off the top of my head, there's the Toshi Action Fund, there's a Bitcoin Policy Institute, 
there's sad center uh there's more legacy ones like coin center and then every single larger organization seems to have some sort of uh footprint with policy right so coinbase has a lobbying department uh, ftx was notably a big lobbyist a big lobby spender uh, so everyone does this at some point right like you get money and then you start pushing some policy and it makes sense when you start seeing the sec enforcement actions it makes sense to start defending your business and defend what you're doing one well, third over to you what's your lay of the land of all these different organizations do you think that they're all moving the right way like not necessarily asking to name names but i'm curious about like what your thought is on the policy landscape right now as a uh, private institution see it i think that the more positive voices we can get out there the better to highlight the benefits of this industry i think that's really really important there's a lot of education that needs to be done in the policymaker community they don't understand how our businesses work well, i mean one of my priorities is introducing us to members on the hill and the policymakers and explaining what it is that we do? How does Bitcoin mining work? What does a miner look like? What is our facility, for example, uh, our large operational facility in tech? What does that look like? Um, you know, we're not just a Bitcoin mining company. We're a construction company. We are uh, a, a manufacturer of, of electrical products. We are a data center. We have a lot of different functions. We are revitalizing two rural communities, providing jobs and education for hundreds of people. Um, so introducing them to who we are and what we do is really important. Some of these organizations help us do that. In terms of advocacy, I would say the ones that are most effective are getting in the room with members, helping them to tell the story like riots, um, and helping them to understand that they have big coalitions of constituents in their districts who care about mm. this. I mean, there was a survey a couple of years ago that showed that I think it was 40 you know, some million Americans have some holdings in digital assets. Um, whether that was Bitcoin in particular, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's obviously, you know, growing to a really large coalition of people who are interested in this space, who want to participate. They're just looking for a little more comfort in terms of rules of the road. Uh, to have institutional investors and consumer investors having the comfort to participate. So, you know, some of these groups have been very good at getting in the room with the policymakers in helping them understand that they have constituents who care about this, who want them uh, to be open to this industry. Um, and I would say a couple other components of effective groups would be, you know, media pressure, having their voices out there uh, with large media organizations through social media, getting a lot of views. Um, and then I would say kind of the, the last arm of it of helping them understand their constituents care, helping them understand it's, a, it's industries with lots of employees kind of coalescing behind the strong message, getting that out through the media. And then the last arm I would say is helping them understand that good policy will make them look good also to their constituent in the end and some uh some groups are are better than others in terms of getting to the right policy some are more incremental and want to tinker around the edges some are more revolutionary want to really kind of create an entire new eco ecosystem for for what we're doing um i think we're very much in early discussions in terms of what the law is going to look like for the next year or two and i think there's a lot of good healthy competition going on in terms of who's going to be leading those conversations. Um, Satoshi has been very good on the state front, getting expressions of support from policymakers in various states. That's very helpful. The laboratories of democracy can be very helpful. There's a reason we're in Texas, because Texas is a very favorable public policy environment. Obviously, we want to show through our work in Texas that it's a really good thing to have a large Bitcoin miner in your district. That means you're going to have a lot more jobs. I mean, we are the largest employer in our county, uh, where our Rockfield, the Rockdale facility is located. Um, we want to help them understand that uh, we can be really great on some of the issues they're concerned about. If a politician's concerned about climate and energy, let's help them understand that like Bitcoin miners are great for the grid and for renewables and for you know achieving clean air and clean water goals. Um, so. Some of these groups, like Satoshi's focus on the state stuff, Bitcoin Policy Institute, the Digital Chamber of Commerce, some of the other trade associations in D.C., like um, Council for 
crypto innovation, the blockchain association. There's lots of groups now that have kind of sprung up um, and have been able to get meetings with policymakers. Um, I'm not sure what's going to be kind of the most effective path. Every, not everybody's perfect. Everybody has strengths and weaknesses. But if we have this many voices rowing in a similar direction of positivity for our industry, I think that's going to be a good thing in terms of hitting on those problems that I mentioned. Constituent interest, industry co like cohesion and momentum, and media pressure, and then you know, hopefully that results in good policy at the end of the road. 100% agree on that. Just for Riot platforms and your work more granularly, what are you guys looking at focusing on? Is it going to be the DC level or is it going to be the state level or something else? So uh, I think DC has probably the biggest threats and opportunities over the next couple of years. So we'll spend a lot of time on the DC piece of it. Um, and part of that is a function of the success we're having in Texas, that Texas has been really welcoming and their policy environment is the most advantageous. We can't take it for granted. We have to keep being active, having those conversations in Texas. We're active with the Texas Blockchain Council. Um, I'll be you know, in Texas later this month. We're going to have a group of hopefully some legislators, educators, um, people who work in the public policy space, all visiting our facility, learning how it works. We're not going to take our foot off the gas because uh, Texas has been good to us. We want to make sure that we're being good to Texas and that we continue to have a really positive, mutually beneficial relationship in that state. But I think the DC piece of it, we're seeing more of the opportunities and risks in this policy space. And you see it on a daily basis in the headlines. Um, mm. you know, obvious states where like New York passing the moratorium on mining you know, good thing we're not in New York anymore. But uh, really, we, we want to make sure as much as possible the federal government is going to be taking cues from Texas and not New York in this space so that we can have uh, a, a more favorable environment. Gotcha. Well, you mentioned the phrase we're going to turn towards next, which is risks and opportunities. And there certainly are a lot of risks and opportunities to explore. Uh, let's go through a few of them. One that I'm actually interested to begin with is that energy question, right? Uh, we live in an age of climate change. We live in an age of climate pressure. Uh, there's a lot of public pressure to maintain a uh, small amounts of use of energy. Bitcoin is anything but that. Tell me a little bit about uh, your thoughts on like the energy debate and Bitcoin mining and how from a, a lobbying perspective, Riot Platforms is going to go about policy on this topic. Sure. So uh, it's a really, really important question. And I would kind of set the set the table by saying that, look, we, we had a report come out of the White House where they tasked the EPA, the Department of Energy, um, FERC's uh, uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission with coming up with standards, try to make sure that we're using the least amount of energy possible, um, maintaining clean air, clean water standards, avoiding e-waste, all noise, pollution, all, all kinds of different um, metrics that they've kind of tasked agencies with looking at our industry. Um, and they said at the sort of the end of that section of the report, if establishing standards won't really accomplish their goals, they should consider limiting or, you know, sort of eliminating, you know, mining. Um, you know, that there's a lot of research to be done, a lot of conversations to be had. Um, Capitol Hill will be weighing in, of course. Um, but that, that really should be a wake up call to our industry that we have to educate these policymakers better about, um, about how things work. First of all is perspective on the energy issue. Like, yes, we use, we are consumers of energy, but I think changing the paradigm on that first point is very important that consuming energy is not an inherently bad thing. Energy consumption leads to a lot of economic activity, quality of life, lots of good things. Um, the next thing is, we consume energy, you know, it's somewhere, I guess, on the spectrum around Christmas lights and video games. But this, the way it's been t talked about is like, well, Bitcoin running uses as much energy as the Netherlands. Okay. You're, you're just plucking data points from the ether and just saying that one matters. But, um, 
really, I think what we should be looking at is what kind of energy we're consuming in Texas. It's a lot of renewables, a lot of wind, a lot of solar. Um, it should be, uh, you know, are we good stewards of the grid in Texas? I would say we are excellent. We're able to, you know, obviously pre-purchase a lot of energy. And then in a crisis scenario, like a deep freeze or something like that, we can sell the energy right back. It can be redeployed uh, to homes or, or whoever needs it. Um, we avoid turning on peaker plants, which would then be you know sort of bad for your emissions goals if you're if you're really concerned about climate. There's a lot of great things that we're doing in this area. I think just saying you use too much energy, therefore you should be curtailed, is just way too simplistic. It is a it, it's I I think a product of a generally kind of skeptical and hostile approach to the industry. We need to diffuse that, and that's part of what I was saying about. Developing the relationships, focusing on education, doing really uh, great research, creating more research products, and then disseminating them to policymakers so that when it's time to make decisions on legislation or regulations, whatever it may be, we're able to deploy and really sort of turn to the relationships and the education that we've been doing to, to activate that work that we've done ahead of time to make sure that policymakers are making informed, good decisions for constituents instead of just kind of acting on the base instincts that I, I think we've been seeing so far. Love it. No, I'm going to turn the question over to you. I had to ask about the energy question because it always comes up, but what are some risks and opportunities that you're seeing from your purview? Uh, we can maybe go down like sequentially or however you want to do it. But energy, we got that one out of the way, but there's there's so many others that I'm sure you're much more familiar with than I am. So I'll hand it over to you. Sure. So, I mean, that was obviously one of them that I, I think is, is I would say is sort of both a risk and an opportunity because the current posture with the report that I mentioned coming out of the White House, where the, the, the departments are tasked with kind of studying our environmental impacts. And you can tell from the language uh, that's been coming out of, especially the White House to their agencies that there's sort of an innate skepticism, hostility uh, in those orders. So kind of writing the ship uh, in the ways that I've described. And we can work through organizations that really represent our industry, the Digital Chamber of Commerce, Bitcoin Policy Institute. Those are two that are very active in Washington, obviously. Um, I've seen Satoshi Action doing a lot of work on that front in the States. Um, but, you know, tr trying to write the ship in terms of... Uh, the impression of policymakers on climate is is very important. Uh, I would say another big uh, risk at this point is that I'm seeing is on the financial regulatory front. The banking regulators and the White House have come out with statements saying that they want sort of the crypto space and the traditional finance space to be totally separate. And it's been compared by many uh, to Operation Choke Point during the Obama administration when they sort of executed a plan to encourage banks and financial institutions to distance themselves from payday lenders, gun companies, other things that were politically disfavored. Um, it sort of feels like that right now. And I, I know it's that message is catching on because I've seen stories just today uh, parroting that and then also messages from the administration trying to combat that, saying, oh, no, 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 this is different. Well, the reason they're saying it's different is not because it's different from a, a policy matter, that it's government offices discouraging private actors from participating in activities that they don't like. That scene is consistent. The difference is they're doing it out in the open now. They're issuing press releases about it. They're issuing notices about it. So they're quite emboldened in this area. And this is something that we really need uh, pushback on because- Miners and every other you know business that operates in this space still needs on ramps and off ramps. We still need bank accounts. We still need to be able to participate in the traditional financial system. So having a, this this idea that we're going to be cut off of the banking system is not only you know, not right. It is certainly unnecessary friction for our industry and something that I think we need to uh, to overcome and and kind of change the landscape on that. I think members on the Hill are very sensitive to it. I think you're going to see that as part of some aggressive oversight from congressional committees uh, with these regulators. I think um, 
there'll have to be some education of the regulators, certainly, uh, and, and hope to change their perspective. But that that's a problem that I think we need to solve. Um, I would say um, with the Treasury Department, you know, making sure that we are keeping them comfortable in terms of anti-money laundering, know your customer rules. Um, obviously, the on-ramps and off-ramps hopefully will sort of maintain their comfort in those areas, but they're trying to do away with the on-ramps and off-ramps. So again, this is there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, and we have to be active on on all of them. I would say on the certainly on the opportunity side, we have the first ever digital asset subcommittee. We have leaders in the House and the Senate on a bipartisan basis saying they want to have a regulatory framework for the industry. Um, and obviously, that's not necessarily directly related to mining. It's more of kind of in the exchange world. But the more we have a framework that works for holding these assets of value, transferring them um, in transactions, the more that happens, the more there is a market overall curiosity adoption of Bitcoin. That's good for Riot. So we're active in that space. We want to help educate policymakers, get to the right result in that space. And then I think another important issue is in some of the proposed legislation, we've seen uh, de minimis tax exemptions. Like if you use PayPal, you're transferring less than $600. That's not a taxable event. If we had some kind of similar scenario, I've seen similar proposals and legislation for that. If you're transferring Bitcoin to purchase something less than $600, maybe that should not be a taxable event. It shouldn't be a capital builds event. You know, that would be something that would lead to more sort of consumer comfort and adoption. That's great for that's great for Riot. Um, there's another a, a bunch of other issues we could get into, self custody, um, CBDCs, and what the outlook for that is. Um, there's there's lots of other issues, but I would say those kind of four are the top of the agenda in my mind, at least. It's the energy climate piece, the financial regulatory piece, potential tax exemption. Um, and then the, the banking regulatory piece so that we can participate in the financial system just as any other company would be able to. I want to go back to that operation choke point uh, point you brought up because it's really important. We had a great article from Nick Carter. Uh, I was just published last week and I'm sure you read it. It was on Pirate Wires, which is like a, for those listening, is a sub stack from a, a venture capitalist. Definitely go check it out. Uh, and it made some interesting points that draw, uh, drew some conclusions from headlines, from press releases, and it really does look like the U.S. government is taking the FTX debacle and using it to turn around and move against the industry. What's your take on worst case scenario? What's your case on uh, good scenarios? And what's your case on like what the likely outcome is here? Really just asking like for more questions about Operation Choke Point from your purview. Yeah, sure. So um, if you look at the timeline in that article, and I had kind of already been sort of assembling a, a timeline like that, it's been uh, s startling, maybe I would, is the word I would use, that you have sort of similar talking points coming out of, the, you had a statement on January 3rd from all three banking regulators, uh, the Fed, the OCC, and the FDIC, all saying that you know crypto assets are inconsistent with safe and sound banking practices. That is a, uh, that's a pretty clear signal. Uh, from these regulators, those are buzzwords that like any financial institution is going to hear that and say, ah, okay, so they they don't want me in this industry. That is, I saw it referred to by Jake Shervinsky from the Blockchain Association as regula regulation by blog post. It's not even regulation by enforcement. It's regulation by blog post. It's just them sending signals to their regulated entities, which means that the regulator is saying, okay, so when we come and do our examination of your business, we determine whether you are appropriately de-risked and we give you a score. Well, you know, we're going to look at whether you're, you're servicing this, this industry. It's, it's a, it's a pretty, uh, troubling statement in my opinion. Later the, that month on the 27th, the federal reserve issued a similar statement saying that they think these principles should apply to state chartered banks. I think that is pretty extraordinary that they did that. You had statements coming out of the white house fairly unusual statements, I think, signed by four heads of offices, the National Economic Council, National Security Council, Science Technology Policy, um, 
I'm trying to remember exactly the all the signatories, but statements from basically staff people at the White House saying that we are cautious about the industry. We think it should be kind of separate. The risks should be taken out of the traditional financial system. We think that um, you know Congress should pass legislation, but they shouldn't make it more integrated with traditional finance banks and financial products. It, they're all kind of rolling in the same direction. You see, see the hostile actions from the SEC. Um, I started to say this is kind of of a piece of this larger slippery slope where every single increment seems to be heading the same direction. So to your question about what's a good outcome, what's a bad outcome, I would say, uh, I'll start with the good news. A good outcome is we get a good, regu fulsome regulatory uh, legislative approach that goes from stable coins to the larger digital asset ecosystem, makes these things um, really more, you know, have the right guardrails so consumers and institutions can adopt them. Um, I would add, we should have a piece on fair access to banking. There's legislation that's been introduced along those lines. Congressman Andy Barr from Kentucky has a bill, fair access to banking. That was sort of a response to Operation Junk Point. Um, so if we could incorporate that, those sorts of principles into this larger framework, that's a wonderful outcome. That's great. We'll have the right kind of guardrails so that we can all participate in the in the financial system the way any company should be allowed to in the U.S., the way any innovator should be allowed to. A bad outcome is the squeezing continues and we get decisions made not based on data and information and productive conversation, but really based on these preconceived notions that I see these agencies acting on. And that will make the U.S. A, an inhospitable place to do business, which is not doesn't mean that Bitcoin mining uh, will cease to exist. It just means it's going to go to other jurisdictions, which mm. their purported concerns is bad for clean energy. It's going to go to a dirtier energy grid or dirtier energy places. Uh, in terms of consumer protection, we're not going to have the U.S. financial system and, and banking regulators and financial regulators, which are typically sort of the world leaders. They're not going to be the world leaders. It's going to go somewhere else. We, we already saw what happened when a government steps in and does uh, the end of the slippery slope, which was China. They just banned it, and it all came to the U.S. If the U.S. makes it too inhospitable, it'll go somewhere else. And in terms of the results of consumer protection or climate or whatever particular issue animates you, that is a bad outcome. So that's why we need to have uh, what I was saying in the first instance lead to the good outcome, which is educate these policymakers, stop the uh, the incremental slippery slope towards pushing our industry offshore, get the more favorable uh, consumer protection laws, financial regulatory laws in place to facilitate innovation, adoption of these products in a safe way. That's going to be the good outcome. So we've seen a few different comments about why people don't want Bitcoin or why they want to limit crypto, regulate crypto. And it goes all the way from Bitcoin is a competitor to the dollar or crypto is a competitor to the dollar, all the way over to this place is just rife with scams. We need to protect American investors. What is your take on Capitol Hill's sentiment or reason behind moving against crypto? Or I should say the White House, really, because it seems Capitol Hill seems to be sort of all over the place. But the White House and some of these administrative bodies. What's the rationale behind Operation Choke Point? So there's several, and it's it's a great question. I'll start with the purported rationale, uh, which we've discussed a lot, which is you know they think it's not consistent with our regulations that protect consumers and the stability of the financial system, uh, climate and energy goals. These are kind of the purported rationales, but there's another one which is sort of a more philosophical, ideological issue. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners, I see them talking about freedom money, you know, decentralization, of course, is is a, a goal. Um, I think that that makes some of these folks very uncomfortable. Um, the idea that you don't need an intermediary. I think a lot of banks have that position. I've heard anecdotally that banks view Bitcoin and other crypto assets and sort of existential threats to their business model, which I guess is one way of approaching this. I think uh, 
optionality for consumers, optionality for um, innovation, getting faster, cheaper, free cross-border payments, I think is a, a goal that we should all share. Um, but I think threats to the status quo uh, make people very nervous. I think the idea of decentralization makes people very nervous. If you look at the sort of the opposite end from a political standpoint, we've heard people talk about you know Fed wallets and and sort of displacing our banking regime with just a federal government relationship with the consumer in terms of holding you know custody assets. I mean, I think that's like the opposite, like extreme in terms that's on Capitol Hill, um, and so that would to me explain kind of some of the discomfort. Um, there's a little bit of fear of the unknown. There's protecting the uh, the industries that to some extent sort of capture their regulators. Um, they don't necessarily like all these new entrants to the market. Um, they like being really strong. I get it. Um, so there's some of that. There's some, so it's some, some ideological, there's some kind of, uh, industry protection going on uh, that's deeper than the purported issues that we discussed of energy, financial regulation. And I think we need to kind of overcome that. And I think the best way to overcome that is educating more of the public, having them educate their members and uh, policymakers in government um, to let them understand that like Bitcoin is not going just because you act in a way that's sort of hostile in the public policy front, like I said, it doesn't mean it goes away. It's just going to go somewhere else. And people who are still interested in it are still going to participate. So it's not something you can ban. It's not something you can say, I don't like it, so it's banned. I know you might be uncomfortable, but learn more and you'll become more comfortable. I think that's kind of how we have to approach this conversation because I think that's the only way to kind of overcome the both the purported reasons and the deeper ideological reasons that we're coming up against. Let's finish the podcast talking about a, a happy note, perhaps. We, we talked a lot about Operation Choke Point, which has a pretty aggressive name uh, and might, you know, downcast some of our listeners. What are some things that you're looking at and being like, wow, we really have an opportunity here to educate policymakers or to move Bitcoin into the right direction or maybe for the industry itself? Yeah, look, at, it's happening. Uh, it takes some time. We're, we're having more and more uh, fora events, um, summits here in Washington featuring some really big names in Congress and from the administration. I think that's great. Getting more involved. Like I said, it's it's sort of the process as I see it. Um, it's relationship development, it's education, and then being able to deploy those things in the policymaking process to get the best, most informed public policy outcomes. I think we're not there yet, but we're getting there. I see more and more meetings and events and summits every single month here in Washington uh, with some of the biggest players in our industry getting in the same room with some of the biggest pu public policy makers in Washington. I, I think some of the most promising things I started, I know we did go down a bit of a darker road, but I wanted to start <laughs> with the, the optimism. And that optimism is like, look, the IRS recognizes Bitcoin as an asset Bitcoin futures trading. Um, there's a big industry push for a spot traded ETF with the SEC. SEC has been very hostile, but like the sort of the parts are getting into the right places. We have a digital assets subcommittee in the House of Representatives for the first time ever. Senate banking committee is taking up crypto as well on a bipartisan basis. We are heading in the right direction as people learn more about it, as people get more comfortable with it. Um, it there's a lot of reason for optimism. It doesn't mean it's going to be an easy road or not a bumpy road, but I think that uh, we are in a stronger position every day. We just, uh, notwithstanding some of the recent headlines and some of the recent action, it's just going to take some time and it's going to take activism, people being vocal, choosing you know to educate their representative, get involved with their members of Congress and, and write letters and help them understand your perspective because the more we do that the more momentum we'll get and the better outcomes we're going to end up with in the next year or two 
Love it. And I definitely agree with that sentiment. Brian, where can we find yourself, like your Twitter or your blog post or anything else that you're working on or publishing so we can support it? Sure. So my Twitter is at Morgan Stern NJ. Um, I haven't been a prolific tweeter, but I need to become a, a more active one in this <laughs> role. Um, that's probably the easiest place to to find me. Um, I have a, my consulting web page is still up. It's win the future strategies uh, dot com. But uh, I'm super excited to be advocating for Riot. I think it's a great business. We're it's it's a wonderful group of people, and I'm proud to be representing them in Washington. And hopefully things stay strong in Texas. I can help, be a small part of helping to make the environment better here in Washington. And our future is you know, just getting started. We're still at a very early stage here, but I think the future is very bright. Love it. Brian, thank you again for your time, and thank you for advocating on behalf of the industry. We'll talk again with you soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me.